Kia ora, kia ora tata katoa. Uh, look, it's a ple pleasure to be here, actually, and uh, uh, to have the opportunity to kind of talk in this way. And I'm just going to share some slides with you now about um, what we uh, are talking about today. And I want to start by thinking about this question, should we still be arguing about equity? Um, if I think about the time that I've been in the health system, um, going right back to um, uh, the middle 1980s, when I uh, helped uh, set up Healthcare Aotearoa and the bicultural primary care process through to today, I think one of the things that has um, uh, really challenged the system is this question of equity and indeed the question of institutional racism in our system. And I think that you, it's hard often for health professionals to get to grips with what really is um, initially a data story without some form of uh, connection or emotional resonance. And this first illustration here in front of you really is the burning of the papakainga down at Orake on the Auckland waterfront in 1952. This is Ngāti Whātua being burnt out of their houses. Now what's kind of significant about this is that's two years before I was born, I'm now 66. And um, it was, this was the uh, outcome of a de decision that the powers of B Auckland Council and the Crown made to clean up that area in um, anticipation of the royal visit from the Queen. Now, when you think about the experience of Māori in New Zealand, and you think about the, um, the reasons why the issues around institutional racism and about the way in which we deal with our treaty partners has been such a matter of controversy, it's hard to escape the 1978 occupation of Bastion Point, which was ended by the largest single use of the state force against the civilian population in New Zealand um, next to the 1951 waterfront strike. And it was in 1982 on that right hand side that for me was the, if you like, um, opening of understanding about what just might have been going on in our history that would have been different to what I had been brought up with, taught with, and actually had experienced. And so on, uh, in 1982, I joined Ngāti Whārua on the land when after the second occupation, they were moved off the land and uh, I was arrested along with Joe Hawke and his whānau. And um, we were convicted of trespass. Uh, well, some of us were anyway, convicted of trespass on that land. And in that, uh, in that moment, and in the subsequent experience with Orake, when Joe invited me to uh, look at running the economic development of the tribe, which at that stage had been reduced to a quarter acre urupa down on uh, <clears throat> the front of the waterfront in Tamaki Drive. You know, I started to understand at a domestic level what the uh, diminution of the Te Tiriti had been where Māori voices and um, challenge to the system and process was coming from, the impact that it had on the lives of Fano right down in the street level, and the uh, need for a much more um, educated uh, Pāge population in New Zealand about the issues that had brought Bastion Point on. And <clears throat> to give you an idea of the scale of the difficulty, if you think that was 1982, um, when we did that second occupation of Bastion Point, then some 20 years on, um, I was got myself involved in the health system at the governance level. So moving from consulting with the healthcare Aotearoa into Helen Clark asked me to sit on the Auckland board uh, DHB, and then I chaired counties and I came back to Auckland. And you know, this um, moment of coming back into the health system in 2018 was uh, along with the summary position uh, laid out by the um, Wai 
2575 summary of the Waitangi Tribunal that the Crown's investment in um, health since 2000 had been so significant and the Māori improvement had been infinitesimal. And I asked myself the question as a kind of New Zealander who is um, wants to see our nation as a nation where people are honoured for who they are, that our treaty partnership is actually seen to be dynamic, seen to be capable of great things in a 21st century context, and to be caught again um, after, for, after so much kind of intention to do the right thing that in fact the outcomes in Māori health have been so poorly advanced uh, was for me a major shock again. And so I determined at this time, coming back into leadership of the DHB, that maybe what we ought to do here is actually have a look at um, health inequities, that we might as well do at a very systematic level, understand what's going on, which is avoidable, unfair and unjust, and deal with it. So this culminated in a series of conversations with DHBs up and down the northern region um, from Waikato North, where the questions were asked, uh, I went to each of these DHBs and to their Māori caucuses and their Māori groupings and Māori providers and asked a series of questions about well, if we were to do something differently, what would it be? And that came um, really resonant um, feedback, which was really uh, DHBs had to be in the process of full partnership with Māori, that Māori had to have the capability of independently looking after their own affairs, that there needed to be real comprehensive reform in the system, and that the kind of levels of putia that had been uh, made available by the Crown for Māori historically were so poor that there needed to be a major and um, seismic shift in what occurred in those matters. And, you know, it was pretty easy to understand just why all the position as it sits today has got, we've got ourselves into this position. You know, when you look at the kind of um, academic constructs of what impacts when equity doesn't go right, you can see that the simple things about the quality and care the access to care and the fundamental um, blindness, if you like, to our health analysis, to the determ social determinants that, you know, this is not just what's happening in the rooms of the GP or in the rooms of the hospital. This is about how does a community resuscitate itself in such a large way from a situation where the Crown has been effectively a um, uh, complicit um, uh, to their diminution in health status. There is no other population in New Zealand that has gone backwards in health terms uh, since the, uh, 2000, uh, the 2000 to 2020 than Māori. This can't be right. And so we have to actually understand just what is the things that drive this process. And an example of um, wanting to get to the bottom of um, uh, the ability of Māori and Pacific to exercise, uh, to be to be enfranchised, to actually be able to experience a health care equivalent to their non-Māori, non-Pacific neighbours. Um, we did an exercise in Auckland District Health Board as a result of um, a series of deep dives which went into each of our clinical practices. And we asked the question, if we put Māori in front in control of this process, what would be the outcome and how would it change? And so astonishing were the challenges to the current methodology that we invested in uh, as, a, as a part of a move to shift the thinking in the hospital and to shift the praxis in the hospital. We invested in an idea of having kaiara hinahi and Pacific Plain Care Navigators to have 
uh, nurse practitioners, both Māori and Pacific, who took a particular interest in the referrals from the general practice, who were able to navigate the process whereby the people in the system were getting access to the care in a way which was, um, if you like, streamlined, that enabled us to really um, think differently about how do we unblock the pathway of care for Māori or Pacific coming into our system. And of course, when we put the, the attention of our um, clinicians and when uh, on this matter, and when we raised their um, raised their understanding of just where the gaps and where the blocks in the system were, we found even with a small cohort of two and a half thousand patients, two thousand two hundred patients within two or three months, that we were able to actually significantly and beneficially shift and change the experience of those patients coming into our system. Now, these were patients referred from general practice coming in whose history had been disastrous. We are uh, disastrous in the sense that the long wait times, the fact that they had very little understanding of how the system worked, the fact that our system, in fact, was, um, to many respects, um, loaded against them in terms of the multiple callbacks that they had to do in order to get through the system. The fact that when there was um, a degree of difficulty in what was being presented, that, that slowed them up. And all this, when compared to non-Māori, non-Pacific, showed that the intervention of the navigators was wholly positive and radically shifted and changed the outcomes. Now, the, the question you had to ask yourself as running the DHPs, if the intervention of the navigators um, could do such positive impact on our system delivery, why had we not been doing that for years before? Why had we not done the self-analysis that would enable us to actually identify where the blockages were? Why were we not putting ourselves in the shoes of the patient who was coming into a system they often didn't have much knowledge of, were uh, not trained in the um, navigating of that system and had been reduced through the process of waiting times to being um, very poorly served in what we were doing. How might we change the whole system and process to um, challenge this? How might we actually get people on board, not from a point of view of you must, but from the point of view inspired to do what was the right thing to do in our system? How could we use the data and the intelligence that we gather on a regular basis to call out practices which were negative and um, were obstructional in what we did? How would we actually use the story, the patient story as being the method and the lever to actually pr prod open processes that had been um, uh, harmful in respect of their delays to the patient groupings that we were most looking to enfranchise. So how did we have to track and uh, address both the structural and the policy issues that would come out of this. We took that on as a process and we're in the middle of it right now. And we're about to invest further in this whole issue of navigation. But the question we're asking ourselves is at what level and at what point do we actually have the clinical community itself change its reflexes around this? And this is the thing that we're most concentrating on at the moment. The navigators have been a huge assistance to prove the point that with um, effective support structures, the people who um, we most wish to lift in terms of their care access can get it and will get it and will get better care as a result of it. But how do we do this? How do we ensure that occurs in our system without needing to um, employ a whole range of these navigators to make this possible? How do we make the system we have it itself much more flexible and intuitive to the needs of Pacific and Māori and what we've uh, and this is what we're trying to achieve. What we found in this process is that um, effectively 
clinicians are prepared to have conversations about equity and racism. Now, when we first got it to this in 2018, um, both the government and the clinical community were pretty apprehensive about going down the route of actually identifying what uh, constitutes institutional racism in the system, what uh, constitutes unfairness or inequity, how this sees itself, and how it um, how it's going to be played out on a national scene. So what we did was effectively take it to the board of ADHB and put up a paper uh, to that board, which was to say, this is how we see ourselves um, not addressing the issues that we should be in relation to Māori and Pacific. This caused a very significant and quite um, influential debate to occur, not simply at the board level, but at the level of the clinic, clinical community. And what we decided to do is be unafraid of taking these issues on, be respectful, be clear, find the language that includes people, but don't fall away from the requirement to actually address face on stuff which becomes clear. It is not simply that people are missing out, but that the structure and the process that we're using is effectively excluding them. Now, this was um, a big and important conversation, which then we shared with other DHBs around the country. Now, one of the things that occurred, which made this really um, easier to do, was that in the most recent uh, changing of board chairs, which was in November 2020, um, we now have five Māori chairs within the 20 DHBs. So the, and we have a, a Pacific, uh, with Ui Markoshi at, at counties. So we've got much more now a context and a environment where these conversations not only have to be had, but that we have to start to change our praxis to recognize the fact that we've done so poorly for so long. It's um, for some quite difficult to do, but for the most part, we are finding that there is um, high levels of commitment to this change. And in the, in the sense, as, as more and more people come with it, then it becomes more and more capable of us to actually go into all sorts of areas of the business where we think there are blockages and, um, and misunderstandings or where there, in fact, are, have been system processes which effectively, on a race basis, deny people access. And we have um, addressed those things and we are doing them um, as quick as we can, and the organization is coming with us. Um, Elsa Clear is the DHB CEO at Auckland, um, began at the beginning of last year, um, a whole series of um, uh, seminars about institutional racism in the DHB. And these seminars have been hugely well attended. And so that when we came to the praxis change, people were aligned and available to do it, or well, enough were anyway to make it uh, positive and useful. And this is the way I think we need to shift and change what happens in the organization. Because uh, you can't just start at the top uh, in the terms of you can't be at the innovation breakthrough performance if you haven't done the legwork around the awareness of, of, uh, in, of inequity, awareness of institutional racism, if you haven't done some of the building blocks here, which actually help to make your business more and more acutely capable of making the pivot to change and to actually understand the reason they're doing it. So you need system and process in the thing. It, it's not simply somebody carrying a torch. It's actually getting right down into the, uh, the base of your organization and examining the things that ought to be done differently, uh, uh, bringing Māori and Pacific into that conversation in the front end, asking them to be part of your critical faculty about the assessment of the things that work and the things that don't work, uh, consider, for example, bringing everybody into this process as an organization so that they understand that nobody's been picked on, but everybody's been examined for the thing that needs to happen and then get on with it. And the, it will be lumpy from time to time. But the um, really important part about this is that you will be making progress. And when you hit a rock, when you hit a rock, when 
um, you get really strong pushback about this stuff. Take the time to pause and to actually give respect to people who don't agree with you. The important thing about this stuff is that it doesn't work with just the people who agree with you. It's because people who start to disagree with you and then come across to it makes it much more powerful as a methodology for moving forward. That's why kind of understanding where you are in the organizational readiness for this equity work is really important for you. And I mean, that's in the end what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do here is um, get to the end of the liberation process here. We, um, we're changing all the dynamics in order to make that happen. This will be uh, several years work for this to occur, but in every part and in every uh, space that we actually make a, uh, an advance, then people get more and more confident about A, having the conversation and B, changing the praxis. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to change the praxis that addresses at its heart the institutional racism and the inequity in the system. We've been brave and honest about it and we're asking people if they wanna come with us and we're prepared to be of assistance and share anything that we're doing. Nō reira, kia ora mai tātou katoa. Thank you very much.